This was the strongest army in the ancient world. A closer look at these statues, and you feel that you seem to have met them before. They seem not to be something buried with the dead, but living creatures. The look on each pottery face gives a hint of a hidden soul and a story of its own. However, the historical books have not put the common people on record. Time and tide have faded out the impressions of the rank and file. In 1975, by the side of the railway in Yunmang County, Hubei Province, an ancient tomb full of bamboo slips was discovered. We opened the door, and outside the tomb, the bamboo slips were found. They were all dirty. They were 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 dirty. The coffin was soaked in underground water. Where the temperature was constant, and so the bamboo slips had not rotted, and the corpse remained in good shape. What is written on most of the bamboo slips are legal articles of the state of Qin. However, a small part of the bamboo slips reveals something like an autobiography, which gives a brief record of someone's life. This man had the name Xi. Mr. Li Xueqin, a historian, showed great interest in the life of this unimportant person. He believed that Yunmang County, at the time when Xi was alive, was already included in the Qin's expanding territory. He was a Qin man, maybe from the Qin side. But he, uh, should say, was born in the local area. Because at that time, the Qin had been around for a long time. Due to the fact that contemporary Chinese writing is developed from the Qin characters, Chinese people today are mostly able to read the Qin bamboo slips of more than 2,000 years ago. The slips read that Xi was born in the morning when the roosters crowed in the 45th year under the reign of King Zhao of Qin. That means Xi was two years older than the first emperor of Qin. Two years later, when Xi's brother Gan was born. The Qin army was fighting Zhao at Changping. That was the fiercest battle in the world at that time. War at that time marked the everyday existence of the common people's life in the state of Qin. In the year that the first emperor of Qin was crowned, Xi reported his age to the government, the so-called Fu Ji. 由于啊这个战争情况吧，他到十七岁就要复级了，所以复级就登记作为一个壮丁。Xi's autobiography answered a question that had puzzled the historians for years: When did people in Qin start to get enlisted in the army? Xi reported to the government when he was seventeen. It seems that people in Qin came of age at seventeen. After the report, the government could call and send men like Xi to go to war any time. The slips recorded that Xi was sent to fight in the third, fourth, and thirteenth years of the first emperor of Qin. We don't know what Xi exactly did in the army and how long each period of service lasted, but Xi was involved in fighting three times between his twentieth and thirtieth year. It was then understood that there was no strict regulation as to how long the enlistment lasted. From 17 to 60, whenever the country needed, every adult man within this age group could be sent to war. The three battles Xi took part in were possibly small in scale. Xi wrote in his autobiography a year before the Qin army launched the unification war that all men generally registered their ages with the government. The historians discovered in amazement the same records of the year in the historical records written by Sima Qian, which says that that was the year when the Qin dynasty ordered every adult male to have his age registered. It seems that both common people and great historians. 
put particular emphasis on the age of registration. In fact, this census was carried out on the order of Emperor Qin and was to prepare for the large-scale battles to unify the country. During the ten years of war for unification, the Qin dynasty manoeuvred approximately one million soldiers. The population of Qin was around five million. That is to say, one out of every five people was a soldier. This ratio has always puzzled historians, and Xi's experience could possibly give an explanation. According to Xi's experience, Qin practiced a universal military service system. When war broke out, every man should be available unconditionally for the country. It's assumed that most of the men in Qin had the same experience as Xi. In order to launch the unprecedented war for unification, Emperor Qin recruited almost half of the men of military age in the country. Only in this way could he build up a huge army of a million soldiers. According to the records in the bamboo slips, Xi did not take part in the Ten-Year War for Unification. He became a legal secretary to the county magistrate. He probably served there till the end of his life. His autobiography abruptly stopped in the 30th year of Emperor Qin's reign. Examining the bones in the coffin, physicians confirmed the fact that the man was around 45 years old. These then were the remains of Xi. He was a cautious and conscientious local official, and he copied great quantities of legal documents. At the same time, he wrote his autobiography. It was due to this autobiography that we came to know the life of Qin soldiers over 2,000 years ago. The common soldiers, such as Xi, formed the million-man army. Of the state of Qin. In the West, Alexander the Great had an army of fifty thousand men. The Roman army had just several hundred thousand men during its most prosperous period. At the time of the agricultural civilizations, military force was limited in scale, and one of the important reasons was the impossibility of producing enough food. It was only the state of Qin in ancient times that was able to maneuver an army of a million men and fight for years continuously. A hundred and thirty-five years before the Qin Emperor unified China, a man named Shang Yang came to Xianyang with the hope of realizing his political ideas in the country of Qin. Shang Yang's suggestions for governing the country greatly influenced the Qin King. It's recorded in the historical records that the two men talked for three days and nights. After that, Shang Yang started wielding power in the state. And carried out his policy of farming and fighting. This policy lasted for the next 135 years. Shang Yang stated that there were only two things worth doing in one's lifetime: to cultivate the land and to fight. A continuous and expanding war could only be carried out on the basis of a rich agriculture. The historical record says the policy of farming and fighting finally led to the ambition to unify the entire country. But how was this policy put into practice, and how did it affect the five million Qin people? The succinct historical document doesn't have an answer. In 1975, archaeologists discovered another tomb near that of Xi, which was smaller and less grand. But two pieces of wood with characters written all over them excited great interest amongst the archaeologists. They discovered from the scripts that the tomb belonged to an ordinary Qin person who lived during the late Warring States period. The two pieces of wood were, in fact, letters to a family. 
At that time, paper had not yet been invented, so the letters were written on wooden slips like these, about 20 centimetres long. These are the earliest family letters discovered by archaeologists. Now, who wrote these letters over 2,000 years ago? During the late years of the Warring States period, Chinese society was in unrest. Why were the two brothers away from their family? Hei Fu, in his letter, said there were rebels in Huayang County and they were sent there to fight. Referring to the historical documentation of that time, Specialists discovered that the war in Huayang took place at the time when Qin conquered the state of Chu. The two brothers were amongst the rank and file of Qin soldiers, fighting against Chu for the unification of the country. In 223 BC, the war for unification launched by Qin was drawing to an end. Of the six states, there were two left unconquered. Chu was the strongest and most stubborn opponent of Qin. According to the historical records by Sima Qian, General Wang Jian led a Qin army of 600,000 men and fought for two years before Chu was conquered. The experts discovered that He Fu and Jing had written in their letters to the family about their life in the army which was attacking Chu. They asked their family for money and clothes. Jing seemed to be in an urgent hurry. He wrote that if his mother failed to send him money in time, he couldn't possibly survive. <laughs> Hei Fu was waiting for clothes from his mother as soon as possible. If it was more expensive there, he would expect more money so that he could buy cloth and make clothes for the summer. These were just ordinary family correspondence. However, they revealed very important facts. Judging by the need for money and clothes from home, the Qin soldiers possibly got no provisions or pay from the army and had to rely on their families for their daily expenses and clothes. Did the families then also support the soldiers with their grain ration? There was no mention of this in the correspondence. Si, who was buried in Yunmeng County, must have been a person very much devoted to his post. As a local legal secretary, he had written all the complicated legal articles onto bamboo slips and would carry them with him even after his death. Researchers carefully studied the bamboo slips. In Chinese history, Qin is noted for its strict laws. However, the actual contents of the Qin laws were hardly to be found in historical records. In 1975, the more than a thousand pieces of bamboo slips before the specialists clearly recorded all the legal regulations of the Qin. These are among the contents on the bamboo slips. Fraudulent applications and claims for grain rations by soldiers were not allowed. Anyone who did so would be exiled to a remote area for two years. Private sale of grain rations by any soldier was also punished. It was also regulated that food allowances for officers and private soldiers be different. The bamboo slips finally revealed that in the state of Qin, grain rations for the army were supplied by the state. When Qin launched its war against Chu, it maneuvered an ever larger number of troops, including the two brothers, He Fu and Jing. The situation on the open battlefield in the state of Chu can be imagined. Banners and flags flying, men shouting, horses neighing, troops everywhere. Providing the daily necessities for these 600,000 men must have been an endless transport line. During the Chu War, the Chinese 
呃，每天就需要两千六百六十多辆车运送这个这个粮草。那么，如果运程超过四天的话，那么在这条这个粮路上运行的车辆就应该在一万辆以上。According to the history books, the grain ration needed for one soldier was about 20 kilograms a month. The war in which the Qin conquered the Chu lasted for about two years. The grain needed amounts to more than 500 tons. If Qin didn't have a developed agricultural system, it would not be able to produce this huge amount of grain and would not be able to run a war on such a scale. 云梦勤俭是田律人一开始啊，他是提到了是吧？呃，天呢，呃，如果是下雨了，是怎么样啊？雨的范围是怎么样？那应该怎么样上报？应该怎么样怎么样管理？他都有规定。When sowing, two and two thirds dough of seeds per mu should be used for rice, one dough for cereal or wheat, two thirds of a dough for red beans, and half a dough for soybeans. If the land was particularly fertile, the amount of seed used could be a little less. 那么这些个都是这个，我相信我们可以相信是根据。当时呢，在这个关中啊，这个主要的秦的这些土地、农田的地区啊，经验的结果，它不是随随便便规定。The state governed the farming in a detailed and concrete manner, going as far as setting up laws to ensure that all peasants adopted the most advanced farming technology. At the time of the Warring States, draft cattle began to be used instead of manpower to plow the land. The significance of this was as great as when tractors began to replace cattle and horses in modern time. So farm cattle held a vitally important position in the policy of farming and fighting. It was written on the bamboo slips that each county should have its number of farm cattle registered. If more than three farm cattle died in a year due to improper breeding, the owner would be found guilty, and the officers in charge as well. 对耕牛，他是非常重视的。如果每年要进行啊四次的评比，如果你啊评成下等，那么马上啊就跟你啊要进进行处罚。If one were in charge of raising ten mature cattle and six out of them turned out sterile, that person was found guilty of a crime. Related people were punished respectively. 你不能啊拼命把那根，还能让它吃草。如果是啊根了地以后。销牛销售了一一寸，就要打你啊！使用牛的人呢，撕下鞭子，那都非常严格。The historians knew that Qin had strict and complicated laws. However, the bamboo slips discovered in Yunmeng clearly and vividly showed people to what extremes these laws went. According to the law. When the tools the peasants borrowed from the local government became worn out after long usage, the local government should not ask for compensation on their return. Why should the state attach such importance to iron farm tools? This big pit used to be the tomb of a Qin king. In the early 80s, archaeologists found in this tomb a large amount of iron farm tools. It was concluded that anything buried with a king must have had great value at that time. So it seems the iron farm tools at the time of Qin were no ordinary implements. When the army was still fighting with weapons made of bronze, Qin encouraged people to make use of iron farm tools. So the iron tools were a revolution, like farm cattle. Qin is probably the Chinese vanguard in the use of iron tools. At a time of owner peasants, Qin successfully managed the microcontrol of agriculture with these rigorous laws. It was quite advanced in terms of management, even to the present day eye. This advanced management resulted in highly developed agriculture.
However, due to the limited area of the kingdom, even this developed agriculture still could not support a huge army that was expanding day by day. That was a headache for the state's policy makers. 85 years before Qin unified the country at the palace in Xianyang, the Qin Prime Minister Jiang Yi had a bitter debate with the general Sima Tuo over whom should be the first enemy to be conquered. The former was for Han State in the east and the latter was for Ba Shu. The then Qin King adopted Sima Tuo's suggestion and conquered Ba Shu. The history that followed proved the fact that this was a far-sighted decision and paved the way for the success of unification. Ba Shu, now Sichuan Basin, has been a natural breadbasket over the past 2,000 years. Once Qin occupied Ba Shu, it had sufficient grain reserves for the army. According to the historical records, dozens of years later, when Sima Tuo attacked the state of Chu, the Qin army came down along the Yangtze River with 10,000 ships carrying 6 million hu of rice. However, over 2,000 years ago, the Chengdu Plain was not able to provide a steady supply of grain to the Qin army. The Min River often flooded and droughts also occurred. After Sima Chu, Li Bin came to Ba Shu as the executive chief. It was this man who made this fertile plain the richest of all. Li Bin had a weir made at a certain section of the Ming River, dividing the water flow into two. When the flood arrives, the water flows over the dam and passes down along the dry riverbed. And when drought occurs, the water is led through this narrow Baopin Pass to irrigate the fertile land in the Chengdu Plain. This was the greatest water conservation project in ancient China, known as Du Jiang Yen. Du Jiang Yen built after it, for 15 years, the world is called the Tian Fu. The Sichuan is called the Tian Fu. It was at that time. This ingenious water conservation project virtually ensured the highest possible grain production. After this project, grain production was far higher than that of the other states, but the Qin rulers were still not yet satisfied. In 246 BC, the would-be first emperor of Qin took power. It was time to unify the country after a hundred years of building the power of the state. The weak Han state was the first target to be attacked, but things didn't turn out to be as simple as that. The capital of Qin state was Xianyang, which was in the plain in the middle of Shanxi. This area was the heart of the country, but the grain reserve there was not sufficient due to lack of rainfall. The then Qin king, Ying Zheng, had always been worried about this. One day, a man named Zhang Guo came from the state of Han. He suggested to King Ying Zheng that he dig a canal to link the Jing River and the Luo River so that the water from the Jing River could be used to irrigate the dry land by the side of the Luo River. Then there should be no fear of drought anymore. The canal would run as long as 250 kilometers and would cost a huge amount in materials and manpower. Zheng Guo's this suggestion immediately got the Qin King to agree. He said, "This idea is good. I will appoint you as the general minister. You go and build this bridge." Even now, the vestiges of this construction are still visible in the central plain of Shanxi. According to archaeologists, the huge stones now found in the Jing River were leftovers of the dam constructed by Zheng Guo. This mud dam is evidence of the canal. Build 
But in the middle of construction, the first emperor of Qin realized that it was Zhang Guo's secret scheme to use up his state strength so that he couldn't attack the Han. Still, he spared the spy Zhang Guo and let him go on building the canal. As stated in the historical records, Zhang Guo's canal was over 250 kilometers long and would irrigate a land of 280 mu. It was another major water conservation project after the Du Jiang Yan. It turned the middle of Shanxi into a fertile land and marked the completion of three major bread baskets for Qin. It was in the year when the canal by Zhang Guo was built that the first emperor of Qin launched the general attacks to unify the country. The Han, who had been behind the plot, was the first to be destroyed. The two wooden letters sent from the soldiers at the front to their family in the rear during this war for reunification were the earliest family letters discovered in China. The writers of the letters were He Fu and Jing. The war took place at Weiyang County in present-day Henan province. The distance between the front and the family was approximately three to four hundred kilometers. Fortunately, the family letters from the front reached their destination. Many people were mentioned in Jing's letter. The one he missed most was his newly married wife. Hei Fu, in his letter, sent his regards to his sister and some others, but mostly worried about his mother. He asked his brother Zhong to take good care of her. Two younger brothers were serving in the army while the elder brother was at home taking care of his mother. It can be imagined how happy the mother and the brother would have felt on receiving the letters from Heifu and Jing. Summer came and with it the heat. The sons far away at the front were still in their winter clothes and they had spent all their money. Their mother at home must have been very worried. The letters were found in the tomb of the eldest brother, Zhong. In ancient times, people would have their dearest possessions buried with them. The fate of this family probably gives us an example of the life of thousands and thousands of common people in remote history. They had a family the same as we do. They had joys and sorrows. Under the policy of farming and fighting, they had only two things to do. Go to the front or cultivate land. It can be assumed that in Qin, every man was part of the army. Qin mobilized the entire country to fight. <laughs>